Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you today to this uh, BIOS webinar on SPINE. BIOS stands for the British Indian Orthopedic Society. And we have been organizing uh, core topics for uh, exam going trainees and as well as other colleagues over the last few months. Today, we're uh, talking about SPINE. We have um, a few home uh, uh, keeping. We would like people to keep their uh, programs on mute, please, so that there's no background uh, noise. Uh, we're going to start off with a topic on cervical uh, trauma by Grace Swamy, followed by thoracolumbar trauma by Darren Dewey. We will then have an overview on scoliosis by my good colleague Morgan Jones from the Royal Orthopedic Hospital, Birmingham, followed by Simon Hughes, who will talk about tumors in spine. And to round it off, we'll have Prof Qureshi from Nottingham, who will talk about a topic that's very relevant today, not just medically legally, but also for the patient care, that's called equina syndrome. Um, I just want to also thank all the faculty in advance for their time. And with no uh, further loss of time, I'd like to uh, uh, re request my good friend, Grish Swami to kick off with cervical trauma. Thank you. Thanks, Shah. I'm screening my, uh, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Can you all see that now? Yes, we can, yes. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks to BIOS for organizing this wonderful series. Uh, we're doing the uh, spinal uh, talks today, all extensive uh, topics, uh, and we've got some amazing speakers, but uh, due to paucity of time, I'll be mm -hmm. restricting it to the very basics. Uh, if there's any questions, we'll be more than happy to take them. So I work as a consultant orthopedic spinal surgeon at uh, Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals in Norwich. So if you, if you look at the epidemiology of cervical spine injuries, uh, they account for almost up to one third of all spinal injuries. And uh, the C2 is the most common level of injury with odontoid fractures uh, having the lion's share of the contribution. And we all know that. Among the subaxial spine, which is C3 to C7 uh, level, the C6, C7 injuries are the most frequent. And it's also important to appreciate that a cervical spine injury can be associated with a neurological injury in as high as 15% of these patients. When we talk about understanding cervical injuries, we should appreciate certain differences and we should always have a good understanding of the surgical anatomy and what are the differences in the surgical anatomy of the cervical spine when you compare it with the rest of the spine. And also, what are the associated structures which could either be directly injured or be injured later on with an iatrogenic injury when you're trying to treat these patients? It's very important to understand the functional anatomy of, these, uh, of the cervical spine, wherein we normally, when we talk about function, we talk about upper cervical spine in a different sense to the subaxial spine. And it's very important to understand the biomechanics of the cervical spine. What is the physiological range of motion? What are the what are the structures that help them do this? And what are the structures that are actually preventing them from exceeding the physiological range? The orientation of the facet joints is very important to understand. They're different in cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. And when we talk about uh, any spinal injuries, we keep talking about stability and instability. So what is it we understand by the word functional stability and what defines an instability? And also when we are talking about any uh, injuries, we should have a clear pathways of evaluation of patients. How do we clear the cervical spine? What further investigations we need? And how do you manage patients? How do you manage the patient in general? And how do you manage the injury specific? And with oh, um, cervical spine, there are lots of specific injuries that we need to have a greater understanding of. Within this upper cervical spine, we have occipital condylar fractures, the occipital cervical dissociation or injuries, C1 injuries, C2, that could be a peg fracture or a hangman's type injury or a C2 body fracture. And obviously the subaxial fracture dislocations, which are not uncommon. So when I, when, as I said, understanding the anatomy and the associated structures is very important. And the vertebral artery is almost uh, always a very important structure when we talk about uh, cervical injuries. Seven, up to 70% of the vertebral artery injuries are associated with cervical spine fractures and a smaller percentage can be associated with, uh, can be due to iatrogenic injuries as a result of anterior or posterior spinal surgery. 
And if we take, if we look at a cross section of this uh, at the level of C5 vertebra, you can clearly see the enormous structures, important structures that we're having to deal with. And this is all more relevant when we start talking about how we treat these fractures through our surgical approaches. And in in, through an anterior approach, you can encounter the esophagus, the trachea, the carotid vessels, the sympathetic trunk, a whole host of structures. And even when we're treating these uh, injuries through a posterior approach, there are several layers of muscles with, which are densely packed with neurovascular structures. So when we mention about the functional anatomy of the biomechanics, we generally, we can categorize all cervical spine trauma roughly based on the specific injury patterns. And the common characteristic mechanisms that are involved in, in these injuries are compression type injuries, a flexion extension type mechanism, uh, which affects the tension band, which I'll uh, talk a little bit in detail later on, and the rotational force vectors that are involved in causing the injuries. So a good understanding of the functional anatomy and the biomechanics, which allow the range of motion is very important. So the function, functionally, cervical spine is divided principally into upper cervical spine, which involves the C0, which is the occiput, uh, C1, C2, and the lower cervical spine or the subaxial spine, which is C3 to C7. And essentially, the occipital cervical joint is devoid of any discs, and there, the stability principally comes from being a ball in a socket joint. And that is facilitated by the superior articular facet of C1, which is pretty con which is concave. And the motion that happens at the OC joint is predominantly nodding. This is what happens at the OC joint. But when we look at the C1, C2 articulation, it's quite different. And the articular, uh, the facets, the articulating facets are almost convex. And it's a convex surface sitting on a convex surface. And this allows the atlantoxial joint motion, which is predominantly rotational. And, and if you all, if anyone listens to uh, the stand-up comedies, it's it's generally regard, regarded as the great Indian head shake. That. The, within the subaxial spine, the C7, the C3 to C7 uh, vertebras, the, they have a fairly similar morphology. The three main anatomic stabilizers here are the uncinate process, the facet joints, and the circumferential ligamentous buttress, which is the ALL and the PLL. So when we talk about stability and instability, we uh, almost always refer to these two gentlemen, Punjabi and White, who were the initial gurus of uh, spine biomechanics. And what Punjabi and White uh, defined the stability of the spine to be was the ability of the spine and the physiological loads to limit patterns of displacement. So as not to damage or irritate the spinal cord of the spinal nerve roots. And in addition to this, to prevent incapacitating deformity or pain due to structural changes. So what it means in short is they should, uh, a spine should withstand load, maintain posture and protect neural structures without pain. And when we, in, during compressive forces, the vertebral bodies and the discs are the limiting, uh, are the things that prevent further deterioration of the compression forces. In flexion extension, there's a whole host of uh, paraspinal muscles, ligaments, facets, and ALL, PLL, which comes into play. And rotation is almost always a function of the upper cervical spine, and the ALR ligament is the primary rotatory restraint. And the work for, done by uh, Punjab, uh, Punjabi and White on the left-hand side clearly demonstrates that most of the movement within the cervical spine happen within the C0, C1, C2 region. And the orientation of the facets, as I was mentioning earlier, it's very important to understand the differences between the facet orientation in the cervical uh, thoracic and the lumbar spine, especially in the transverse and the frontal plane. And the orientation of the facets facilitates the cervical spine to be able to do flexion, extension, lateral flexion and rotation, which is very important. So talking about instability, when we talk about instability at the level of C0, C1, what defines or what constitutes instability. So when there is an axial rotation on one side, which is more than eight degrees, then it's regarded as unstable. Or if there's one millimeter translation between the base on, which you can see here, uh, and the dense inflection extension views, uh, 
then that is regarded as uh, being unstable. There are a whole host of classifications, all is based on dense interval, which if more than 10 millimeters is re generally regarded as abnormal. Trinellis uh, classification for Atlanta hospital dislocations. So there are a lot of definitions and lots of classifications uh, defined, uh, which talks about instability. One of the things that is mentioned a lot, which can be asked in the FACS exams uh, as well in the MCQ part of the exam is the powers ratio, uh, which is essentially assessing the cranial vertebral relationship distances. So as you can see in these figures, if the BC to OA ratio is more than one, then it generally indicates a Atlanta hospital uh, dissociation, normally 0 0.77. And obviously, if it, these uh, relationships are quite unreli uh, unreliable in patients who have congenital anomaly or atlas fractures. And this is an example of a patient we treated uh, not long ago, a 33-year-old male patient involved in a road traffic accident then where you can appreciate there's an anterior dislocation with widening of the C0, C1 space on the left side. And we treated with a posterior hospital cervical fusion procedure. So when we talk about instability at C1, C2, what are the parameters that we are looking at? Uh, if, there is a, if there's more than seven millimeter lateral combined overhang, of C1 on C2, that is deemed un unstable. If there is more than 45 degree of axial rotation of C1 on C2 to one side, that's unstable. If there is translation of more than four millimeters of C1, C2, that is again unstable. And the space available for the cord is very important. And if it's less than 13 millimeters, that is unstable. And at the level of C1, C2, the transverse ligament is very important. You can see that on the figure on the right hand bottom corner. And if there is disruption to the transverse ligament, that uh, renders the C1-C2 unstable. And any significant ligamentous disruption on MRI scan should be regarded as uh, the spine is being unstable. So here's an example of C1-C2 instability that can clearly be appreciated in the flexion use on the right side. So there are various techniques that we use to treat these patients, uh, various posterior techniques that we use uh, the historical techniques were the Galley and Brooks techniques, uh, but we nowadays we use the Margrel's uh, uh, technique, which is a transarticular approach, and the Goyle and Harms, which is a transparticular approach, and the Wright's technique is also used, which is a translaminar approach. A lot of work being done by Makoto, Yashodi, Yoshida, Tan, et al., uh, their group, especially on the safety of the vascular and the neurovascular structures uh, associated with the with, in treating these injuries. Uh, this is an example of a C1-C2 dislocation. It's a complex injury uh, and we treated with the trans, uh, the, with the goyle harms technique. Uh, and this is a picture. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand is that the anatomy of the vertebral artery is not the same in all patients. As much as 22% of uh, normal population can have an abnormal trajectory of the vertebral artery. So it's very important to evaluate the vertebral artery before we embark upon treating these injuries. And this is a picture of uh, uh, Wright's technique, uh, which is essentially showing uh, the trans uh, translaminar uh, technique of uh, fixation of these uh, fractures. Uh, when we talk about subaxial spine, what constitutes instability in the subaxial spine? If there's a sagittal translation of more than 3.5 millimeters or 20% translation in flexion extension radiographs, that is deemed unstable. Or if there is a sagittal plane angulation of more than 11 degrees, that is deemed unstable. Any disruption to the anterior or the posterior column, as we mentioned before, is unstable. If there's any injury to the spinal cord itself or the nerve, or the nerve roots, or if there is abnormal disc space narrowing. It is very difficult to assess instability in cases of ligament injury. It's quite challenging. Lots of cadaveric studies have shown even when the interspinous, supra and infra, uh, interspinous ligaments have been disrupted, they can still be stable. But the key structure is the PLL. And that's why sometimes these, these injuries can be missed even on CT scans. And a, a clear demonstration on, on a T2-weighted sagittal MRI scan shows 
the PLL is disrupted at C3, C4 level, there's disc herniation and subsequent cord injury. So we should rely upon MRI scans uh, if there's any doubt. So coming back to the understanding of the cervical spine, as I mentioned, it's very important to understand the differences in the surgical anatomy and the associated structures, what constitutes the functional anatomy as against uh, surgical anatomy, what are the biomechanics involved in uh, dealing with cervical spine injuries. Understanding these is very important before we start treating them. So uh, we've had, historically, we've had many classification systems uh, for uh, throughout the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, but the Joint uh, Knowledge Forum, uh, the AO right to condense everything and uh, made it much more simpler. Uh, it may look a little daunting when you look at it, but I, I generally look at this as uh, to our general orthopedic surgeons, I say that this is like your Gustula Anderson's classification. So it's got an A, B, and C, and in the cervical spine, of course, you have the facet injuries associated. So if you look at it, A type A injuries are compression type injuries. Type B injuries are distraction injuries, which involves a disruption of the tension bands, either an anterior or posterior. And type C injuries are translational injuries. And these are usually where the rotational vectors are involved. And obviously we have the facet injuries. So we have some examples. The, this is an AO type injury, wherein there's hard, it, this could just be an isolated uh, fract, tiny fracture of the spinous process or the lamina, and or just could be a sprain. When we go to the A1 type injuries, a single end plate fracture is a very tiny fracture of the superior, uh, super anterior end plate. There's no posterior wall involvement. Whereas the A2 type fractures are more the coronal split or the pincer type injuries, th these can still be stable and we can still treat the, these injuries uh, with conservative measures. Whereas the A3 and the A4 type are the burst fractures, we, they can be an incomplete or an incomplete burst, and these are generally deemed unstable because of the involvement of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Type B injuries, as I said, are distraction type injuries. Uh, where there is a tension band disruption, either in the back or the front. B1 is the posterior tension band injury, which is uh, uh, which involves a bony component. This is the this is equal to your uh, chance bony chance type injury. These this essentially involves only the bony component, whereas the B2 type injuries can involve the capsular ligamentous and the ligamentous uh, structures in the back. And again, uh, the MRI scan clearly highlights the fact that if you're suspecting these type of injuries, please get an MRI scan as against just a CT scan, because sometimes these can be missed. These are also analogous to your uh, ligamentous chance injuries. And when there is disruption to the anterior tension band, uh, they are called B3 type injuries, and these are highly unstable, that needs uh, surgical stabilization. Type C injuries, this is an example of a type C injury. Uh, the one on the right hand bottom corner was a, a patient, a 29 year old trapeze artist that I treated not long ago, came in with a significant um, injury when she slipped off the trapeze uh, when she was doing some tricks. Uh, she, was, she was doing that in a circus recently. And obviously these are nasty injuries. They almost always need surgical fixation. So, if, and obviously the facet injuries, which we all come across these facet injuries, it can be pretty much undisplaced, which is the F1 type injury, or it can be associated with uh, subluxation, dislocation, or they can be purged facets. And obviously the, the degree of instability increases as the, uh, from F1 to F4. So in short, we have ABC type injuries in the cervical spine. Uh, C is the translational injury associated with the rotational vector, highly unstable. The B1, B2, B3s are also unstable because that, that it affects the tension band anteriorly in the posterior, posterior tension bands. And the A type injuries are compression type injuries. So in fur to further understand the cervical spine, uh, we need Two to minutes. have an understanding yeah. of the uh, cervical spine, the, how do you, uh, the in further investigations, principles of management, and to have a clear understanding of the specific type of injuries. But I think uh, due to paucity of time, we will be stopping here. Uh, and we, we, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to answer that later on.
Thank you. I have one question from, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, one question from Walid. Uh, very quickly, if you could uh, clarify how you treat a facet joint dislocation uh, okay. reduction technique, and also whether you do it on the sedation or a GA, and if that failed, what you would do with regards to uh, further management, please. Okay. So it, 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 this is actually quite a, it's a big question. Uh, yeah, it is. Yes. Further, uh, the treatment of facet uh, joint dislocations or facet uh, joint subluxations or perch facets uh, depends on whether it's a unifacetal dislocation, whether there is involvement of neurological structures, uh, whether the patient has is completely uh, neurologically uh, intact or whether they have neurological deficit. And the most uh, difficult a part of treatment are those patients who are neurologically intact because you would risk during your process of fixation, you would risk a significant a neurological injury. But in, in short, the principles are you, you should always get an MRI scan for these patients. You should do a thorough neurological examination before you start treating them. Get an MRI scan to see whether there is any disc involvement, where is there is disc disruption uh, affecting uh, the, uh, either compressing the spinal cord or the nerve roots, that kind of generally tends to make a difference to the treatment. And most of the time, if the patient is awake, sober, and if they do not have any neurological deficit, then uh, I like to treat them awake. I like to reduce my, the fractures awake using a halo fixation and it's debatable whether you want to go from the front or the back. And it, it, sometimes we have to go from both front and the back, depending on the, the extent of the injury. So uh, the, the basic principles are always get an MRI scan. If the patient is awake, try to reduce the fracture in a awake patient with some local anesthetic and uh, halo uh, stabilization. Once you fix the patient in a good position, under CRM, under direct CRM vision, then you can make your choice about whether you go from the front or the back. A lot of times we end up doing an operation from the front because the patient is already supine and it's very easy to control. And occasionally we have to go from front and the back. Sometimes you have perch facets, which is very difficult to uh, reduce. You go from the front, fix it from the front, go from the back, and then you can uh, freshen up the facets and, and do a posterior fixation. So it, it, it is, it's quite a challenging thing, it, 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 but it essentially depends on the nature of the injury and whether the patient has got neurological deficit or not. And in fact, you can do a whole talk on facet joint dislocation. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope that answers your question, Walid. Uh, thank you very much, Girish. And uh, I'd now like to request uh, Mr. Garg to put on uh, Mr. Louis's uh, talk, please, uh, on thoracolumbar burst fractures and the classifications. Thank you. Thank you, Girish, again. Thank you. hospital in London and uh, thank you to Mr. Halim for inviting me to. Hi everyone, my name is Darren Louie. I'm a consultant at St. George's Hospital in London and uh, thank you to Mr. Halim for inviting me to talk at the British Indian Orthopaedic Society meeting. And this talk is about thoracolumbar spine trauma and how I use the AOTLIX classification. So I was always taught that uh, when answering whether or not the spine required surgical intervention to think of the surgical sieve, is there a neurological deficit? Is there instability, which may be causing pain? And is there deformity or could deformity occur? This essentially is a whittled down and condensed version of the white and Punjabi definition of clinical stability of the spine which I encourage you uh, all to read, particularly as, as residents. It was always very useful for the FRCS. Why do we use fracture classifications? Well, it's an injury identification, a severity description, it allows communication, it's a guide to prognosis and treatment, and it allows comparisons for auditor research. And as Mr. Lucas taught me, it is a knowledge discipline. And if we look at the old Magro-Leo classification, there are 33 or more options. 
it is quite difficult to remember it all and it can be quite difficult to use. So um, what are the good points? Well, it is mechanistic and anatomical, but it doesn't have an indication for conservative versus surgical management. Where things really improved was the 2005 TLIC score, which Alexander Vaccaro came up with. And this was further improved in 2013 uh, with the AO spine classification, which morphed the old AO spine classification and the TLIC score. So these are the original papers um, in 2005 and then 2013. And I wanted to discuss briefly about the TLIC score itself. And of course, it was really good and really easy to use. It spoke about the morphology of the fracture. And this had uh, some mechanistic aspects similar to the AO classification. Importantly, they were the first uh, to really look at the integrity of the PLC. But the problem is they required an MRI. And they put quite a lot of weight on this, uh, up to three points. And the neurological status, um, you'll notice, to had a slightly higher score for incomplete cord injury, uh, which potentially is understandable given that um, one should get to theatre uh, with more uh, significant weighting for, for that. The need for surgery was then based on a score of more than four. The problem with the uh, TLIC score uh, is highlighted in this paper. Um, and they found that a quarter, 25% of neurologically intact patients with a thoracolumbar burst fracture at the T11, T12 junction with a TLIC score of two failed non-surgical management. This is because it is difficult to ascertain whether the PLC uh, is truly injured. And, um, and in fact, one should not uh, necessarily have to use an MRI to determine whether or not uh, patients have an injured PLC. So when we look at the AO TLIX classification, it uses the basic tenets of the AO MAGRO, compression fractures, tension band injuries, or dislocation or translation injuries in type C. Uh, the AO is a transverse or spinous process fracture. Uh, A1 is a simple wedge fracture, uh, where only one end plate is involved, uh, but no posterior wall. A2 is a split or pincer type with no involvement of the posterior wall. A3 and A4 are burst fractures. Um, and the difference is whether you have a single end plate in A3 or a double end plate injury in A4. And I think what's really important to remember is that a laminar fracture can occur, and therefore these could potentially be Denis uh, three column injuries, but without a B, uh, Modern, without a B-type, uh, i.e. they're not without a distraction injury. So in the B-types, you either have an anterior tension band failure, as in the B3 or B2, where you have a posterior tension band injury. And B1 is a simple uh, monosegmental bony uh, posterior tension band fracture, otherwise known as a chance fracture. Uh, whereas B2, which is going to be more common because it involves uh, ligamentous osseous a disruption where it could uh, involve the disc or it could involve uh, a A3 or A4 <laughs> fracture uh, with that. B3, as we said, is a hyperextension injury, very common in ankylosing spondylitis. And you can see the nature of, of the injury here uh, with, the, with the ankylosing spondylitis. And it's essentially a long bone fracture uh, with these patients going into hyperextension. And type C injuries are translation or displacement beyond the physiological range, and they can be subclassified with a B and an A uh, subtype as well. And this is the way in which we use it. Always start off by asking yourself, is there translation? Look at the coronal plane, look at the sagittal plane, distinguish whether or not there is translation, then decide whether or not there is hyperextension, then whether there is a posterior tension band injury, is B2 or B1, and then look at the vertebral body fracture pattern is it a burst fracture, A4 or 3, and then subsequently down the line towards A2, A1, or in fact, uh, no significant injury. You will now notice that the incomplete uh, cord injury and complete cord injury are scored exactly the same, but more importantly, there is a high score of 3 when neurological exam is not obtainable. And I think this helps to warrant surgery where the fracture pattern um, is significant 
uh, but the patient may be untunded. If they were uh, well enough for surgery, they should be given the benefit of the doubt uh, in order to preserve uh, neurological function. Interestingly, uh, the PLC has become very much a downgraded part of this system because it is not uh, as reliable as we once thought. And it's certainly, we also learned that you just do not need an MRI in the, um, in the, in the significant trauma situation. And so now only a, a compression A-type fracture in which the status of the PLC is unclear could get one point. M2 modifier is very useful uh, and it helps us to, to influence the decision of surgery. So sometimes you may, for example, be covered in third degree burns and surgery is not possible, and in which case you have an M2 to help you decide against surgery. However, you may have a polytrauma in which you are going to surgery in order to fix two femurs, a tibia and a humerus, and fixation of the spine is going to aid with mobilization um, and therefore uh, is, is a useful uh, adjunct. And we say that a score of less than three is for conservative management, four to five is for conservative or surgical management, and a score of more than six is for surgical management. So it's going to take us through uh, just a handful of cases, because I know I only have 10 minutes. Um, a 38-year-old male in a road traffic accident in spinal shock. Um, how do we classify this and is it stable or unstable and should they have surgery or, or be treated conservatively? And when you look at this, we want to see, is there translation? We'll go back to here. There certainly is in the, in the coronal plane. And you can see, as well, in the, in the sagittal plane. So it definitely comes out as a type C first. Is there a tension band injury? There certainly is. It's not a hyperextension. It's a flexion injury and therefore it's going to be a B2 or a B1. And in this case, the posterior wall is involved in both end plates. So um, we know this is going to be a B2 because of the uh, ligamentous uh, osseous injury. We know it's going to be an A4. They're in spinal shock. And we move all the way down here. Yes, there's translation. Yes, there's a B2 and yes, there's an A4. We also know that there is potentially a complete cord injury until proven otherwise because he's in spinal shock. And we get a score of 23, a C, B2, A4, N4, and an M2 potentially because he's a polytrauma. This is unstable and he warrants surgery. What about something like case two? 59 year old female, she falls down the stairs and she is neurologically normal. So. Granted, I don't have a coronal image here for you, but let's say that she, when we look at our algorithm, is she a translated? No, she is not. Is there a distraction injury? Is there a distraction injury of the anterior band or posterior band? No, there is not. The distance between the spinous process is absolutely fine. There's no disruption of the ALL. You look at the uh, simple wedge fracture and there is no burst component of this. So this is uh, going down the algorithm. It's not a C, it's not a B, uh, probably just an A1. There's no neurology, uh, so neurologically intact. And we see that this is a stable uh, A1 wedge fracture, which only scores one point. Uh, here we have a patient who's fallen down 15 steps bilateral flail chest, fracture of the right scapula and fractures of the thoracolumbar spine. You can see bilateral uh, hip replacements as well. And in this patient, you can see that they have an element of ankylosing spondylitis uh, from their bamboo spine. And you can see a significant injury uh, here and possibly one here. And uh, this is a hyperextension injury. But when we look through our algorithm, Granted, there's uh, in the coronal plane, you would look whether there is translation or not. Uh, in, in this case, I'd tell you that there isn't, there is no significant translation in the sagittal plane either, but there is a hyperextension injury uh, in two planes, but there is no neurological deficit. So actually what you have here is a T910B3, which is seven points, and you have normal neurology, you have an M2 for ankylosing spondylitis and polytrauma, but you also have L12 where she has a B3 uh, injury as well as an A1 injury, totaling uh, 15 points, which certainly says that um, 
surgery is warranted. Uh, I wanted to introduce a polytrauma case where the M2 modifier really uh, mattered. Um, here we have a gentleman who's fallen uh, from a conservatory roof, uh, landed on his legs, a severe uh, leg pain as well. And you can see that in this case, there is no translation, there is no significant distraction injury, but there is a burst fracture and it's of a single end plate. This probably is an A3 injury. And um, from this, we don't think the PLC is injured, but it could be. So you could even put, you're not sure, and there may be an M M1. This is going to be, uh, and here's the burst fracture on the axial. But look at this, he's got a tibial plateau fracture, and there it is. You're likely to want to fix that, and a calcaneal fracture, which is going to need to be stabilized, potentially even uh, with an external fixator. Um, we go down our algorithm, and as we move down the algorithm, uh, we see, okay, he was neurologically intact, but he had an A3 injury, which was three. He had a possible PLC injury um, and no neurological deficit. This is only four, and four is equivocal, may or may not need surgery. But in view of the fact that he's going to have surgery for his calcaneus and his tibia, and he's going to require a degree of early range of movement uh, in order to rehabilitate and get out of uh, hospital faster, then uh, surgery is warranted uh, potentially uh, for the spine. So uh, I'd implore you to remember that the Aotelix is good for the planning and management of your patients. It's a good uh, knowledge discipline. It's a thought process. It may not quantify the deformity. So no classification is going to answer it all. Many people often ask me, do you, should you do anterior or posterior surgery? And I would ask you to look at the Bob Gaines and McCormick classification for that. Um, but I hope that this has helped you understand the classification a little bit better. And, uh, and the way in which it can be used for the optimal management of your uh, patients. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Darren, this excellent uh, talk. I think there was a question with regards to uh, the number of levels of fixation above and below and using mono or poly articles clues. Um, do you have any um, reply, please? Yeah, so um, there are a few papers on the biomechanical stability of that. Um, I suppose at least to tell uh, Amjad from my personal preference, it's generally to think about two above and two below, particularly if it's significant comminution. And particularly if you're in a situation where you may not have the ability, it might be a damage control operation uh, in a polytrauma. So you're not gonna want to have the extra blood loss of putting in a cage. You can always come back for a second stage to do that. Where I find you can go one above and one below is if you uh, look at the CT and you've got an intact pedicle and you've got a bit of uh, substantial uh, body, you can put a small screw into the uh, into the fracture site itself. You probably just need one and it does increase the mechanical strength of the construct. Um, one of the useful things to know is if you're going to use a monoblock screw, use the monoblock screw in the fracture site, particularly if you want to create lordosis between the uh, three points for your three point fixation. So if you were in the lumbar spine, you clearly don't want to do two above and two below because of the loss of movement. Um, using a monoblock at the fracture site, so say with a four, then you'd only have a three and a five uh, pair of screws. And at the four, you could have a monoblock screw and that will really help uh, create the indentation or the three point fixation of the, of the rod. And of course, um, otherwise you're, you're, if you're using, if you're starting off, I mean, the posterior, uh, percutaneous stuff, use poly screws because it's it's much more forgiving. And you will find that as you start off, if you don't have a perfect wiltsy screw and you're coming in on top of a facet and then the next screw goes in a proper wiltsy fashion, you're going to have rods bent all over the place and it's going to look awful. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank um, you, Darren. Th thank you, Darren. I'm sorry I'm going to push you out now. I know you'd love to speak about this. Uh, thank you very much mechanics. for taking your time. Can I please request... Um, my good friend Morgan Jones to uh, talk about scoliosis, please give us an idea. Thank, thank you, Darren, again. Uh, hi, Mr. Sean. Hello to everyone. Thanks kindly for inviting me to talk today. Um, Char, are you going to share the presentation your side or do you want me to do it my side? Uh, I think Sunil is going to do that now. Yeah, I can, I can do that if that's okay. Yeah. So I've tried to, ju just to the trainees, I've tried to cover things essentially that you're not going to get easily off ortho bullets. It's um, not focusing on those 
um, more common aspects of uh, scoliosis, but really trying to get to the principles behind treatment, um, which often don't come over very well on, um, on the bullet point type websites like Author Bullets. So hopefully this is of some use to you. And if, if you just uh, commence the talk, I'll address any questions after. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Morgan Jones. I'm a spinal consultant uh, at the Royal Orthopaedics and Mr. Holmes asked me to give you a brief overview of scoliosis. Uh, so this is a fairly broad church, um, 26,000 hits if you go on PubMed. And for the sake of um, keeping it as straightforward as possible, I'm going to limit the discussion to early onset scoliosis and adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, and try and address any uh, possible gaps in knowledge that uh, may be there. Um, so early onset scoliosis is um, essentially a scoliosis in those under the age of 10. Um, you may be familiar with uh, subclassifications within this group of intermentale idiopathic, which are those under the age of three, commonly boys, often uh, resolve uh, by themselves, or juvenile idiopathic, uh, those four to 10 years of age. Ad adolescent idiopathic uh, is 10 to 18 years, um, significant preponderance for uh, female sex, uh, tends to be a right thoracic curve. Um, <clears throat> we'll start off uh, in more detail with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, an instance of about 3% um, for the lower magnitude curves as the size of the cob angle gets uh, greater, uh, the incidence falls um, in the population. Uh, in terms of etiology, there's a lot of work uh, has gone into this, but it still remains unknown. There's clearly a complex genetic um, interplay uh, mixed with some sort of uh, mechanical component, uh, uh, which leads to uh, expression of uh, the scoliosis. Um, but uh, twin studies um, out there have demonstrated uh, there's clearly uh, not just a genetic and uh, um, component at play it is uh, also um, in part driven by other uh, factors. In terms of history and examination, this is something that I would expect uh, most people to be fairly familiar with already, um, but uh, points of note would be make sure that uh, any um, <clears throat> possible uh, abnormal neurologic symptoms are uh, fully assessed and investigated, including the use of uh, MRI whole spine. Uh, make sure not to forget um, indicators of maturity, including uh, age of uh, menarche, uh, or other medical conditions or family history uh, that may be associated. Uh, in terms of examination, um, standard orthopedic principles, look, feel, move, uh, followed by special tests. Um, in terms of the special tests worth um, mentioning, abdominal reflexes must be assessed as part of the um, examination and any asymmetry um, further investigated with an MR whole spine. Um, be sure to be familiar with how to do uh, an Adams forward bending test and uh, make sure uh, leg length discrepancy is, uh, is assessed for. Um, this is a fairly typical example of a uh, young girl with um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, image on the right demonstrating uh, the rib rotation as highlighted by the scoliometer. Um, next slide here is demonstrating um, a fairly mild uh, scoliosis on the left uh, with a more severe uh, example on the right. And as you can see on the right, the significant rotation leading to uh, the rib deformity, um, <clears throat> trunk shift uh, and uh, asymmetry of the skin creases. Um, for those who are planning on sitting the clinical examination, um, <clears throat> make sure uh, to be mindful that this is often a scenario where more unusual cases are brought out uh, and you'll see uh, conditions that are often associated with scoliosis, uh, for example, uh, neurofibromatosis in this case. Uh, Marfan is a good example, as highlighted here. Uh, they often have scoliosis as well as a host of other orthopedic conditions. Um, has cavus or just simple leg length discrepancy. Um, moving on to treatments, um, 
A significant number of patients simply require reassurance and observation. Uh, some will require bracing and those uh, who demonstrate progressive curves um, will ultimately uh, be headed towards surgical instrumentation and fusion. Um, however, treatment depends on, um, as with anything, the natural history of the condition as well as the curve size uh, and its uh, potential progression. Um, you should be familiar with the Weinstein article, which is a 2003 uh, JAMA paper um, reporting a 50-year uh, follow-up of a cohort of untreated uh, patients with scoliosis. Uh, this study was out of Iowa uh, in the States, and essentially uh, what is reported that um, patients who are uh, untreated often have a fairly uh, productive and functional um, high functional level uh, 50, 50 year old uh, follow-up that said um, in, the, in the sort of finer print it does report that there's an increased risk of shortness of breath uh, which was associated with a cob angle greater than 80 degrees uh, specifically in the thoracic apex um, and this uh, this has been borne out in other studies demonstrating that once a curve uh, in the thoracic region gets above 90 degrees it tends to have a fairly detrimental effect on um, patients uh, cardiorespiratory function. Um, <clears throat> Lonstein is another author who uh, is worth um, noting. Uh, this is a series uh, written up a number of years ago back in the 80s of over 700 patients who had idiopathic scoliosis um, initially with a curve between 5 and 29 degrees and then followed up to the end of skeletal uh, growth um, now, uh, what he demonstrates, or, or the take-home message from this, essentially, is that as the curve magnitude goes up, it's increasingly, li increasingly likely uh, that a patient's uh, curve will continue to progress. So the bigger the curve, the more likely it is to progress, which makes sense, really. Um, in addition to that, the bigger the curve and the more immature the patient, uh, the more likely the the, the patient is to progress in terms of uh, increasing cob angle. So you can see the grade zero or one uh, pay, uh, RISA score patients with a 20 to 29 degree curve had a 68% uh, likelihood of progression um, or 68% of those curves progress, not likelihood of progression. Um, for those not familiar with the RISA grading, essentially it's calcification of the iliac apophysis with uh, naught being um, no calcification and five being complete ossification to the iliac, uh, sorry, of the iliac apophysis to the ileum. Um, it's of variable value uh, because really um, <clears throat> only starts to manifest um, as uh, kids are approaching the later stages of their pubertal development. So they often have gone through the peak growth velocity by, um, by, uh, it becoming evident, uh, so risk of grade one or two. Um, and so, uh, and just touching on that, it is worth mentioning uh, about curve progression in, in relation to growth velocity. So uh, this chart demonstrates growth velocity for both boys and girls. And you can see as they approach the age of roughly uh, 11 to 14 and hit their pubertal growth spurt, uh, they have quite a significant uh, increase in their growth velocity. And this in turn leads to uh, what is often a fairly significant deterioration in um, size of curve. Um, so it's always worth uh, assessing, uh, in particularly in the girls uh, when Menarc was. And using this to help guide treatment. So the take home uh, message is essentially clinical history and radiographic imaging is gonna help you as a surgeon determine the maturity, the remaining growth and potential for curve deterioration. Or uh, in terms of, uh, in simple terms of treatment, um, as, as, as ballpark figure, observe curves with a cob angle less than 25 degrees, consider bracing curves over 25 degrees uh, in the more skeletally immature, and those patients who have uh, a cob angle approaching 45 to 50 degrees, or it's likely that they will arrive at that point, i.e. at skeletal maturity, will have a, a, a cob angle in the region of 40 to, uh, 40 to 50 degrees. Um, these would be surgical candidates. And the reason for this is they will likely continue to progress beyond skeletal maturity in terms of uh, curve deterioration. Um, <clears throat> so into AS, what happens if we do nothing? Um, 
the the short answer is essentially if it's a big curve in a young kid it'll probably get worse if it does get worse um, and gets up to the region of 80 90 degrees it can be associated with poor um, poor outcome that said those with uh, smaller curves uh, can be well tolerated um, <clears throat> A, uh, a paper worth noting is the brace paper or again from Weinstein is outcomes of bracing essentially it's a dose dependent relationship you need to treat three children for one uh, brace to be effective and the kids need to be in it uh, beyond uh, 16 hours a day essentially to to get a good out um, to get a more effective outcome um, moving on to EOS uh, so we'll just try and touch on this uh, briefly and there's two main groups so uh, the vast majority of curves are resolving curves well not vast majority but the, the predominance of curves will be resolving curves uh, in the very young um, uh, you may see children are non-ambulant who appear to have a scoliosis but as they start to mobilize they, they get back trunk control and then the curve resolves and then there's progressive curves and these are curves that are essentially are greater than 20 degree uh, cob angle um, or a, a rib vertebral uh, angle difference of more than 20. Uh, if, a, if a child has a progressive curve by the age of five, it's likely they will continue to progress uh, uh, and will not uh, generally resolve. Um, the um, <clears throat> Global Spine, uh, Graying Spine Study Group uh, has guidelines for treatment and recommends um, greater than 25 degree uh, cob angle or 10 degrees Donc documented progression uh, should consider treatment uh, with the goal of treatment being a T1 to T12 height of 18 to 22 centimetres and uh, that's the important uh, thing that we need to focus on here is um, essentially log development and why is it important so th the principal thing about treating early onset scoliosis is to optimise lung development and that's because alveoli are added by multiplication after birth up until the age of about eight and 85 percent of alveoli develop after birth so if you inhibit or somehow have a detrimental impact on uh, lung development then it's likely to uh, um, have a, a long-term implications for respiratory function and this can ultimately result in a thing called thoracic insufficiency syndrome some of you may be uh, familiar with this but essentially it's a restrictive lung disease um, which can come about as a result of scoliosis uh, in the uh, more um, skeletally mature. Um, described by this gentleman, Bob Campbell, uh, who came up with this implant system, the vertebral expanding prosthetic titanium rib, um, and was something of a leader in his field. Um, <clears throat> in terms of treatments that you need to be aware of, uh, so as I said, most of these uh, uh, kids will just need uh, reassurance and observation. Uh, those that demonstrate progression should go into uh, what's derotation casting or bracing program. Um, and those that continue to progress uh, with maturity um, uh, will then undergo surgery. And the goal of surgery is not to uh, specifically um, uh, correct any deformity, but to enable uh, continued thoracic development whilst limiting curve progression and there are two main techniques that are, are used in the, in the UK uh, they would be traditional growing rods or magic rods although it's important to note the magic rods are currently withdrawn in the UK but that may well just be a temporary thing um, traditional growing rods uh, this is a multi-center study uh, by Barney and Marx um, <clears throat> it essentially is uh, implantation of um, uh, growing uh, metalwork into the spine that is lengthened under uh, GA until final fusion at or near skeletal maturity. This is what it looks like. Um, uh, but one of the uh, important take home messages is that whilst you may get a significant correction in the curve or an improvement in the cob angle, there's a, a fairly significant complication rate. Um, these may go in children aged three all the way, uh, and they have to have repeat operations all the way up to skeletal maturity. Um, similarly, magic rods uh, was uh, viewed as um, a way of uh, reducing the need for repeat anaesthetics or uh, surgical intervention. However, uh, <clears throat> there's uh, been a high reported rate of mechanical failures. Um, and at the moment, uh, it's been withdrawn from the market. Uh, so in summary, scoliosis. Um, <clears throat> 
is a progressive pediatric spinal deformity. Um, it's uh, severe scoliosis itself can have a devastating impact on their lung development, particularly in the, the more uh, rapidly progressive and uh, younger um, cases. Natural history studies in ES are very helpful in gu guiding treatment thresholds and not all scoliosis requires intervention. Uh, but ultimately, the aim is to limit progression either through bracing or instrumentation uh, with a final definitive fusion should you uh, go down the surgical route. Uh, thank you. I can have some questions uh, following this. Thank you, Morgan. That was excellent. Um, I think we've answered a couple of questions already on the chat. I can't see any more questions. And um, if there are any, please do let me know. I can, I can ask Morgan for uh, a reply. But I think we should currently move on to my good friend, uh, Simon Hughes from Royal Orthopedic Hospital. We'll talk about tumors. Uh, thank you, Simon. All yours. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, many thanks for inviting me here to speak uh, today about um, metastatic spinal cord compression, really. Uh, my name is Simon Hughes. Um, I work at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital with uh, Mr. Halim. Um, we are one of the um, sarcoma units in the country, covering about 60 to 70 percent geographically of the UK. We're also the oldest orthopaedic institution, uh, and it sometimes feels like that even now, looking at a picture on the left. But anyway, uh, there's four colleagues. We all do primary tumour work. But today I'm going to talk about MSCC. So what is MSCC? Well, really, it, it is what it says on the tin. It's metastatic, meaning it's spread. And it's got spinal cord compression, there's compression of the neurological elements. And that can either be within the spinal cord, cord equina, around the nerve roots, and it can be a result of either bone or indeed soft tissue infiltration as well. We can have bone versus soft tissue uh, compression, as we've mentioned, mainly due to the fact that when the tumour arrives on scene, it does one of three things in the spine. It either breaks bone down, builds bone, or does a combination of both. And obviously, breaking bone down, causing lysis will likely result in a pathological fracture, which can then retropulse and compress all the neurological elements. Some metastases though can be expansive and we have to keep that in mind, particularly sclerotic mets such as in prostate cancer, as you can see in the uh, slide below. So where do these tumors ultimately come from? Well, the idea of this talk is to give you the correct knowledge so that you have um, the, the necessary knowledge to pass the FRCS. And ultimately this is quite a common question. The tumours have spread from somewhere else and the rule of twos generally applies here. Two breasts, two lobes to the prostate, two lungs, two kidneys, two lobes to the thyroid, and then you can have myeloma. And generally when people talk about cancers to me as a primary oncology surgeon, I like to split it up into three things. You've got your carcinomas, these are the ones that I've just mentioned, that everyone kind of knows about, breast, lung, kidney, etc. These are cells, lining cells that have become proliferating abnormally so. Then you have your blood car cancers, which are your like myelomas and lymphomas. So these are your hematological malignancies. And then last but not least, you have your sarcomas. These are the kind of odd ones that tend to be more like primary tumors. Ultimately, if you have a scan that shows tumor in the spine and it is a single site or the disease is contiguous across one or two, three, four levels, whatever that may be, but in continuity, you should always have in the back of your mind, actually, is this a primary tumor? Now for FRCS level, you should be expected to know what to do with a primary tumour, and that is always to refer to a primary tumour unit for, for, for um, relevant management going forwards. But in terms of the metastatic stuff, it tends to come from, from those ones mentioned on this slide. So how do these patients present? Well, look, a lot of them have a history of cancer. It's either you know, one that's been known about recently, or indeed even one that's been known about for a long time. So breast cancer is one of these ones that can come back even 20 years down the line. Patient says to you, well, look, I've been given the all clear after five years of tamoxifen. That was back in 2005. It can't be breast cancer now. Well, the answer is it can, unfortunately, okay? Sometimes these spinal mets are diagnosed at initial staging, meaning someone's come into a lung clinic, for instance, with a known lung cancer that's just been recently found, and they do staging scans con confirming that there's metastases on the spine. In about six to 20%, which means you know up to one in five people, they actually present with the malignancy because of the spinal metastases themselves. In the literature, sometimes that's as high as 40%, but I suspect that's skewed data. <clears throat> you should remember though, that up to about 8% of patients can actually have a second primary. So this is someone with a known prostate cancer, for instance, 20 years ago, but is now presenting with a lung cancer metastases to the spine. So you must keep that in mind. Do not assume 
Sometimes they pitch up and actually, yep, yeah, this is an incidental finding. They have no symptoms with regards to the spine. A lot of the time, though, they pitch up with back pain or indeed neurology. On occasion, they can even have systemic symptoms like hypercalcemia, and that's why it's imperative you treat this patient as a whole, not just from the scan confirming that they've got a spinal metastasis, given how dangerous hypercalcemia can be. Very rarely do they present with standalone sphincter dysfunction, and that was shown even back in the 80s. NICE tells us that we should keep an eye out for patients with a history of cancer who have back pain. And that's very clear, isn't it? Ultimately, most metastases will spread to the thoracic spine above all the other areas within the spine themselves. But patients complaining with spinal pain that's worsening, it's unremitting, it's aggravated by straining, they have tenderness in the spine, or indeed any nighttime pain, these are the patients that you must, must, must investigate as soon as possible in order to confirm the diagnosis because ultimately you're much better being proactive with metastatic spinal cord compression than reactive. Always be aware <clears throat> that, you know, when you look at patients as a whole and the general population, 80% of patients will pitch up to the general practitioner at some point in their lifespan with back pain. So that is a huge number. And you've got to ascertain whether or not the patient sitting in front of you is actually complaining of a worsening pain that they normally have, or is this a different type of pain? And do not always assume, like for instance, in this picture here, the MRI, you can see that there's a clear cervical thoracic kyphosis, but in fact, this patient's always had neck pain. The reason why the presentation was delayed or the diagnosis was delayed rather, is because medical practitioners wrongly assumed that this was just bog standard neck pain that the patient's always had. So how should we assess spinal mets? As with anything in medicine, and this is imperative in the FRCS, you start off with a history. You want to know what the pain patterns are, what the timings of specific episodes have been. You know, if the patient is off their legs, then okay, fine. When did that happen though? Right, if that happened four, five, six, seven days ago, big problems. If it's happened in the last 24 to 40 hours, this is a patient that neurologically can be rescued. You've got to get on with things and get them to the appropriate unit. Do they have systemic symptoms, fevers, weight loss, change in appetite, night sweats, these sort of things. These are alarm bells for patients and yourself. You should examine the patient. Now, unlike common orthopedic mantra, you examine the joint above and below. No, this is a patient that needs to be examined from top to toe. Ultimately, you are determining whether or not they have evidence of primary cancer elsewhere. And that should be a thorough examination involving thyroid, breast, auxiliary lymphadenopathy, you name it. You have to look out for those possible primary sites. In addition to that, you must assess them neurologically and that has to be done in a thorough fashion. This is not, can you move your legs? Can you move your arms? Right, you're good to go. No, this is a full Asia score, including a PR by either a senior trainee or a consultant. And the Asia score is useful because it allows us to map the patient and in addition, work out whether or not the neurological deterioration is actually occurring and over what period of time. When you're assessing them for spinal disease, I like to think of myself, first and foremost, thinking, right, okay, is there an actual or impending fracture here? Is there an actual or impending neurological compression? After that, assess them for their overall disease burden. This is not just the spine, this is everywhere else. Is this patient known to have liver metastases, lung metastases, cerebral metastases? Where is the primary? This is what's so important. And we investigate that really logically. Once we've taken the history, once we've examined the patient, we come up with a list of differential diagnoses and we employ a battery of investigations to prove which of the differentials is actually the diagnosis. As I said, we do this radiologically through, for instance, isotope bone scans. But you've got to be careful because these are non-specific, and you must be aware of the false negatives, such as in tumours that are like myeloma, renal cell carcinoma, carcinomas, and those tumours that are lytic more than they are blastic. So as you can see here on this bone scan here, there's not a lot going on in the lumbar spine particularly. Although on the scan below, you can clearly ascertain that at the L2 level, there's a significant right-sided lytic lesion. MRI generally is our investigation of choice, and you want T1, T2 weighted images as well as a stir sequence throughout the whole spine. The reason by being the whole spine is because yes, the patient may have lumbar spine, uh, pain or neurology indicating a lumbar spine pathology but if they have tumor that's theoretically riddled through the rest of the spine that ultimately will dictate what their prognosis is going to be 
You must have axial images through any areas of significant collapse or epidural tumour as well, so that you can clearly map out the tumour and work out whether or not surgically this is a feasible, feasible option. Tumour is typically low signal on T1 image, high signal on T2 image, and you must look out for the soft tissue extension as well. Common question in the MRI, uh, sorry, in the FRCS, how quickly should I get an MRI? These are rough guidelines here. So if you have definitive, definitive treatment planned for suspected spinal mets, then yes, get an MRI within the week realistically. If you have suspected MSCC, we talk about 24 hours. But for me, I think that's probably a bit too much. I think you ought to be getting an MRI ASAP. But if it's out of hours, yes, get an MRI only if you really need to have an emergency transfer of that patient to the spinal unit nearby, or you have an intention to proceed immediately to treatment within your own unit. This is an MRI scan of a patient with known breast cancer 15 years ago. She had a C4 lesion treated five, six years ago with radiotherapy and is now asymptomatic. But the patient was complaining of increasing back pain. Unfortunately, medical practitioners felt that this back pain was more in keeping with standard musculoskeletal pain and, and, and on account of her aging. Actually, that's not the case. She's got clear evidence of metastases now in the lumbar spine. This is all with a normal examination though. There is not a lot to find with this lady. She has full power, normal tone, reflexes, coordination, sensation, no evidence of any long track signs and nothing to really to, to, to hang your hat on. But ultimately she does have metastases in the spine and you would rather be proactive than reactive. CT scan. So we use CT scans for two reasons really. First and foremost, as a staging means, i.e. where is the primary disease? Okay, we now know it's in breast, but what other metastatic disease does this patient have? Okay, they have disease in the liver, disease in the kidneys, disease in the spine. Ultimately, that dictates what the patient's prognosis is likely to be. Second reason why CT, CT scans are so useful is because we can get sagittal and coronal reconstructions of the spine. And should we go along the surgical route, we can adequately map out our surgical planning. Here's an example of an MRI with a renal metastasis at L3. Here's the evidence of the CT scan. And as you can see, both of these modalities give you more information than just one alone. So this patient is pitched up to your, for instance, District General Hospital, which is the common scenario in the FRCS. You are a first year or first day, sorry, foot and ankle, for instance, consultant. You see this patient, what are you going to do with them? Do you refer them to oncology? Do you refer them to spines? Well, you should know the MSCC guidelines, which are, which are national ones. But ultimately, we talk about oncology and spines being two separate departments. They shouldn't really be, to be honest, because you need both. And the simple reason for that is, A, you're not proceeding on with surgery, and that's fine. But the oncologist will now want reassurance about what the stability of that spine is. Do they, for instance, put the patient in a TLSO brace and mobilise them? Should the patient remain under bed rest, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. If the patient is for surgery, so you're now going down the surgery line, then I, as a spinal surgeon, would want reassurance that this patient's prognosis is adequate enough to justify proceeding on with surgery. Ultimately, if a patient has a prognosis of, say, six weeks, it is not particularly likely that you're going to embark on a surgical um, uh, pathway now because the patient will not survive long enough to justify the risks of the surgery at present. That's not the case, though, if they've got 18 months. So surgery, what do you need to know before we proceed on for MSCC surgery? Well, as I said, the prognosis. And the prognosis should include the staging as well as the treatment today. If you are going to be a thorough orthopaedic consultant, and you should be, and that's ultimately why you're passing the FRCS, you need to ask all these details because it is appropriate. If a patient has breast cancer but has only had first line treatment and is now pitching up with metastatic disease in the spine, having never had it before, ultimately they have two, three, four more lines of oncological management that can be employed, which will give them a reasonable prognosis. However, if they've used all four of them and they've now got metastatic disease and the disease is in the vertical is running away now, ultimately we know that the prognosis is poor for this patient and surgery is not likely to be appropriate. Two minutes, Simon. So, stability, hello? Two more minutes, Simon. Thank oh, you. Okay, so I'll need to be quick, apologies. So stability of the spine is important as well. Neural deficit and duration, how long that neurological deficit has been there. Adjuvant treatment options, so what chemotherapy and radiotherapy are the, the oncologists contemplating? What's the past medical history of this patient? Are they physically up for this surgery? 
And ultimately, probably most importantly, what are the patient's wishes? You're treating the patient, not the scan. The patient doesn't wish to proceed on with surgery. It's not appropriate to do so. SIN scores. This is a spinal instability neoplastic score developed by Charles Fisher in 2010, published in Spine. And it has six parameters. And basically, you can roughly judge whether or not the patient requires on CT uh, imaging uh, stabilizing or not. I have to admit, most patients typically pitch up with 7 to 12, and so there's always that gamble about whether or not to operate on them. But you know that if they're less than 7, this is likely to be stable and will not likely require stabilisation procedures. This is an example of this. I'll quickly go through this. You can see on this scan on the right that this patient clearly maximises all of the scores on the SIN score and therefore is more than likely to require stabilisation. On this one here, though, you can see an L4 lesion. And actually, when you score this, it's 10 it's potentially unstable and you'd need to make a judgment call about whether or not the patient required stability and decompression. Other investigations we can use are a PET CT scan and this is useful particularly if the patient has got something called an FDG avid positive lesion and whether or not you think curatively you can improve this patient. Angiography, particularly important if we want to block off vessels, particularly in renal cell carcinomas or thyroid mets, which we know bleed excessively and you must do your very best to embolize these lesions before you operate on them. The initial management of MSCC looks always suspect it and investigate it. Admit the patient if required, keep them on bed rest until you've determined what the stability is, get a senior review, organize an MRI scan and staging scans and get the results for them. There is no point in waiting two, three days for a scan that you ordered the same day. It must get reported immediately. You want oncology input, be an oncologist for the prognosis and discuss the patient with a local MSCC coordinator. In addition, you must assess them anesthetically to make sure they're fit for surgery. Don't forget the basics. Spinal observations are imperative. They're so important. You need to know what the observation show of the patient and how that goes along in time. VTE prophylaxis, pressure cares, respiratory care, bladder bowel care, and GI protection are all important. Why GI protection? Well, ultimately, in some of these patients, you're going to give them steroids. However, the evidence is not clear. I would state that a patient who had symptomatic MSCC, i.e. they have neurological deterioration, or significant back pain, then I probably would give them steroids. But in the absence of MSCC, i.e. METs in the spine, but no cord compression, I certainly would not. You've got to be careful about steroids Sorry, in patients who have lymphoma, because ultimately you can end up having a lesion that's no longer there by the time you come to operate on them. Tumor genetics and markers, these are so important now as well. Long gone are the days where patients were labelled as a simple breast cancer. They have a type of breast cancer with a genetic um, element to it. With Panel 500 and the 100,000 Genome Project, which we're, we're running in Birmingham, we're beginning to know more and more about what the genetic sequences of these tumours are, which is why biopsy is so important. And ultimately, these will dictate the prognosis of these patients going forwards. What's the value of surgery? Well, the paper you ought to know is Patchett 2005. These compared radiotherapy and surgery versus radiotherapy alone. And we know surgery does much better, as you can see on that slide there. The patients walk for longer, they get up, and there's less analgesic use. And I would put this very much along the same lines of a fractured neck of femur patient, where sometimes your anaesthetist will say, God, why are we operating on this patient? Because you know that ultimately, if you don't, you're not going to do well. What's the surgical strategy? Restore and maintain biomechanical stability, improve or protect the remaining neurological function, and hopefully improve the prognosis, i.e. how long the patient is going to live. But you are not going to cure them, and you need to be very clear with the patients and relatives as a result. Surgery treats the complications of the disease, but not the disease in the majority. We can use things like Sabre as, a, 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 as an adjuvant to surgery. Sabre is stereotactic beam radiotherapy. And these are important um, improvements in radiotherapy because they really improve the overall prognosis of the patient. Separation surgery is whereby you have some tumour in the canal. And rather than it radically excising the, the tumour, you may well decide to just get in the canal and take out a couple of millimetres worth almost really in order to free the neural elements up so that the sabre, the beam radiotherapy, can actually work safely around the spinal cord and get rid of the tumour as best as possible. What's the effectiveness of this? Well, it's pretty good. It's much better than external beam radiotherapy, which was a bit like lobbing a grenade at the tumour. This is more like using a sniper rifle, for want of a better word. But they have compression fractures as a result in up to, in some of the papers, 40%. Radiation myelitis is a possibility in less than 5%. And we know that a lot of them will come back with recurrent disease at the site, 21% in some of the papers, and up to two thirds in those patients with epidural space disease. 
Vesperplasty is another thing that we get, another uh, tool in our armamentarium. It's reliable and it can improve pain significantly for those patients that per perhaps aren't particularly great surgical candidates or their life expectancy is shorter uh, th th than those ones we might choose to do a more radical operation on. Transferring for care. Well, look, you should only transfer the, if the patient wants surgery, if the prognosis is good enough, if the neurological status dictates that, and that you understand the extent of the disease. Imaging is essential to transfer, prior to transfer, sorry, unless you think this patient requires immediate emergency surgery. So in summary, an index of suspicion is paramount. Beware of the changes in pain patterns. Always get the appropriate imaging, but understand the limits of that imaging modality. Remember that sclerotic bone can be weak. Too often people will say things like, oh, it's prostate cancer, it's a sclerotic met, it'll be fine. Sclerotic bone is when the tumour is developing bone at the site of its infiltration, but it's almost like a bad builder doing shoddy work. The bone is not always of good quality. And most importantly, try and prevent deterioration rather than actually react to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I think all the speakers have done really well to um, try to keep the talks as short as possible because these are all the last yeah. topics. Um, I now request Nas Qureshi to please kick off on the talk on Cordequine syndrome. Thank you again, Simon. Well done. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Shah, for the introduction, the British Indian Orthopaedic Society for their very um, generous and kind invitation. So I'm going to talk about Corda Aquina syndrome. Um, so these are my main objectives. Um, I'm going to give you the definition for Corda Aquina syndrome. I'll briefly run through the history examination. We'll go through some timing and treatment um, outcome and then finish off with some uh, legal uh, implications of this uh, condition. So Corda Aquina syndrome, in Latin, it means horse's tail. It was first described in the 16th century. It's a rope-like tail of fibres at the distal end of the spinal cord, i.e. just below the conus. It has or contains sensory and motor nerves to the legs, peroneum, anus, and bladder. Um, and Corda Aquina syndrome was first described by Mixter and Barr in 1934. So this essentially is a constellation of symptoms arising due to impairment of corda equina function. It's actually a continuous process, so the compression disturbs the venous return and arterial supply can lead to ischemia, loss of function in the territory supplied by the affected nerve. Approximately one to three percent of lumbar disc herniations can cause um, corda equina syndrome. So in terms of history, of course, listen to your patient. Um, study very carefully the onset and the progression of the symptoms, and also uh, try and glean from the history whether there are other causes, um, for example, postoperative, metastases, trauma, infection, certain medications, and of course, psychosocial uh, signs or uh, indeed yellow flags. In terms of symptoms, 91% uh, um, will have a urological dysfunction, um, low back or, or sciatica, 85% perineal sensory disturbance in 82%. So beware perineal problems with bladder dysfunction. It was Gleven McFarlane who actually divided corda equina syndrome according to the effect on the bladder. So CESI is incomplete, where there is impairment of, of bladder. So it could be a sensory impairment, there could be a loss of desire to avoid, a poor stream, or even strain to micturate. So it's very important that you get this information from the patient in your history. CESR is retention, so loss of bladder control. These patients will have a painless urinary overflow. There's also CESS, which is suspected. So these patients will have low back pain bilateral leg symptoms, and they may have altered sensation in the saddle area, and then there's complete, and they will have no urinary bowel or sexual function. Examination, so you need a thorough examination. You may wish to use the uh, American Society Injury Association um, guidelines and the, and the scoring system, which we certainly find um, really useful. Um, a note on DRE, so digital rectal examination. So you're assessing here for saddle numbness, anal tone and anal squeeze. A study from our unit where we actually created a model anus with pressure transducer and digital rectal examination, which was performed by doctors as well as HCAs. 
And what the conclusion was that is actually DRE has a limited accuracy in uh, assessment for anal tone. So doctors weren't much better than HCAs. So therefore we concluded that this actually is not useful in suspected chordoquina syndrome. And further absence of anal squeeze and contraction is actually a late sign for chordoquina syndrome and suggestive of CESR. Further, there's variation in the sacral dermatomes. So the S1 could be here on the left, you see in this figure, it could be below the knee, or actually it could extend um, higher up um, towards the uh, buttock area. Similarly, S2 could be limited to below the buttock, or actually it could extend to the perianal region. So you can see that saddle anesthesia may actually not be specific to chordoquinus syndrome, as large L5-S1 disconiations causing S1 nerve root compression may also produce this hypoanesthesia. Uh, MRI remains the investigation of choice. Uh, there's some good, um, uh, well, there's a quite a large study from, from this year showing um, um, the reliability of a limited sequence scan. So just doing T2, sagittal and axial, which can be done in 10 minutes. Um, and this uh, same paper looking at uh, bladder scans MRI, so out of all the patients that were referred to us for cauda equina syndrome, only 18% actually had cauda equina syndrome. The, looking at the anal tone sensitivity was only 52%, perianal sensitivity, 82%. And what we found quite interestingly was the post void residual volume. So greater than 200 mils had a very high sensitivity specificity as well as a negative predictive value. And you'll see here that a less than 200 mils on the post void residual scan had a very high negative predictive value of 97%. In other words, if the PVR is less than 200, you can be pretty sure that that patient doesn't have corda equina syndrome. So we concluded that blad bladder scanning um, for PVR assessment is a useful adjunct to the history and examination. In terms of treat treatment, you're gonna perform a decompression of the corda equina, you're gonna remove the disc fragment, Bear in mind that the, um, there'll be stretching um, over the uh, theca, um, and therefore you need to be really quite careful in how you handle the nerve roots. There is in fact no data on unilateral versus bilateral approaches, laminotomy or laminectomy, or even senior or junior surgeon. But I would, I would put to you that if you have a case like this, where you've actually got quite a, a bit of central and right-sided compression, you could do this through a small laminotomy. Alternatively, you may actually want to give the, the, the nerve and the, and the dural sac more room and therefore perform more of a generous laminotomy. And that would certainly be my practice. There have been two papers looking at large disc herniations. So 52 patients in total with large disc herniations occupying more than 50% of the canal. And no, none of these patients actually develop quadriquina syndrome. In fact, only five had surgery for radiculopathy. So large disc herniations can be managed conservatively. Timing. So this was the first meta-analysis done by John Kostiewicz's group. This was uh, 20 years ago now. Um, and they found that there was a significant advantage to treating patients within 48 hours versus greater than um, uh, 48 hours from the onset of symptoms. Uh, this paper, however, was criticized four years later um, for flawed methodology, misinterpretation of results, um, and uh, the uh, reporting and understanding the value of early surgical intervention. Um, following that in 2008, uh, another uh, meta-analysis actually showed that the uh, findings supported early surgery for chordoquina syndrome, and that we should also be uh, dealing with CSR and CSI uh, patients separately rather than uh, combining them into, an uh, into one study. Um, and then the final review was by uh, Nick Todd from Newcastle. So they had 50, he had 56 human and uh, animal studies of corda equina syndrome. And the main conclusion here is that the longer the corda equina nerve roots are compressed, the greater the harm and the poorer the extent of recovery. So this should prompt, uh, this should encourage prompt diagnosis and surgery for all corda equina syndrome patients as soon as practically possible. In terms of British guidelines, so this was from the British Association of Spine Surgeons, they actually gave no timings, but they did state that nothing is to be gained by delaying surgery and potentially much to be lost. They suggested that MRI should be performed at the referral centre or if it's out of hours, there should be some local policies um, in place with referral to the regional spinal centre. They concluded that decompression should be um, performed at the earliest opportunity, considering the duration of symptoms.
the prognosis, what factors guide the prognosis? Well, of course, the neurological status, that presentation is very important. The duration of symptoms, is it single or multi-level? Is it unilateral or bilateral? And even the nature of the injury. So if it's an acute onset of a few hours, I put it to you that these patients would probably benefit greatly from uh, an urgent uh, procedure. When you're looking at outcome, the studies actually show a lack of uh, clinical equipoise complexity, and there's a lot of mixed match of, of uh, symptoms, but generally you would say that for CESI, 90% of patients will achieve normal or acceptable bowel and bladder function if they have their operation within 24 hours of onset, and that goes to approximately 40% if it's after 48 hours. For CESR, it's a little bit less predictable, um, but the outcome is worse with anywhere between 20 to 80% having a satisfactory bowel and bladder function recovery. It's also worth bearing in mind that if you are um, sitting on a CSI patient's, uh, patient, 25% can actually progress to CESR within 24 hours. Finally, on the legal position, well, if you're gonna give advice, make sure it's clear. Um, please explain very clearly the signs and the symptoms or the red flags patients should be aware of. For consent, explain risks in a manner that the patient and the family understand. Explain your aim of surgery is to preserve function. There may be some improvement, but there may be some deterioration. If you're gonna operate in the early hours, um, then consider the experience of staff, the increased morbidity. And certainly these have been some of the reasons that people have put forward to not operating in the middle of the night. But if there is a delay, document it clearly. Uh, this was a study that, that we did um, of uh, nine years of um, successful claims of uh, litigation. So we had 235 successful claims in England. Um, and you will see here that a, a quarter were down to missed quarter equina syndrome or delays in diagnosis or treatment. So in summary then, accurate history taking for patients with quarter equina syndrome, a very careful examination. However, I put it to you that conventional physical signs have a low sensitivity and specificity. The post-voyage residual of greater than 200 mils is a, it's a pretty good leverage for urgent MRI scans, um, as well as a history and examination. And it's an objective measurement in suspected quadroquina syndrome. If the, neg if the MRI is indeed negative, and you saw in our series up to 20% are, consider other causes, urological, neurological, psychosocial, or other causes. If quadroquina syndrome is confirmed, most patients will have a large disc herniation. Please document clearly your findings as well as the discussion that you have with your patients and explain and again document clearly the reasons for the delay. And finally, I think that this is a, a pretty good summary um, of um, how we uh, manage quadroquina syndrome. So in patients have a large disc with a unilateral radiculopathy, you can do a watchful wait for these patients, but please warn them about red flag signs. Or suspected, these patients will have bilateral radiculopathy with a large disc. Again, you can do a watchful wait, warn them again about red flag signs. And if there's any question about them moving across into the CSI group, the incomplete group, then they undergo urgent surgery. For the CSR with retention, they may be difficult to assess as they're catheterized. These patients will go onto our emergency list with operation the same day. And for CSE with complete loss of quarter equina function, again, they go onto our emergency list, but they can potentially be uh, deferred to the next day. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think that was an excellent talk by Naz, um, as usual. Uh, I think we have a quick question from Sunil Garg. Could you please ask the question, please? Yeah, thanks, uh, Shah. Nasser, that was a really amazing talk, uh, a very good summary uh, for, for, the, for, for the exam goes. But for someone like myself, uh, I'm a non-spine surgeon. I work in a district general hospital. Availability of outer powers MRI scan has always been a problem. And I don't know, it might still remain a problem over the next five, 10 years. And we're always in this difficult situation where clinical signs and symptoms, as you clearly elucidated, are not very reliable. And even if you have a scan, a post-word scan of 150, 180, 200 mils, the, the, the scan is, is still difficult to get. So for, for, for in the best interest of patient, and, and then how do we then actually convince the, the, the tertiary hospital to take our patients and or how do we gather more evidence and prevent ourselves uh, getting into the litigation suite? Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for your question. So that's a, that's a really important point. And uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, something that is uh, just confined to your hospital. I'm, I'm sure there are other 
places as well, other DGHs where you know similar similar problems exist. So uh, we have a so I obviously work in Nottingham. We have a catchment of approximately four million. Um, so in terms of the referrals that are coming to our uh, to our hospital. You've already alluded to the history examination. The, the post void residual is something that we always ask. Um, and um, the, in terms of the MRI scans, yes, exactly like you've said, you know, they'll have uh, MRI scans up to five o'clock, but they can't perform MRI scans that, um, thereafter. Well, we have local policies in place for that. Um, and unfortunately, it will be something that, you know, you will have to discuss with your, you know, your, your head of service, your directorate, your managers, in terms of getting local policies and local guidelines in place so that these MRIs can, do, can, can get done, um, if not at the local hospital or this, they've got to be referred to the tertiary. Um, and as I've already said, the PVR for us is something that we found really useful into guiding um, the, 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 the referrals uh, uh, centre in terms of should we urgently transfer the patient across to get an MRI or, or, or can it wait? But please speak to your uh, management and your seniors and, and try and get local policies in place. I mean, this has to be sorted out. As you saw from the litigation um, aspect, I mean, the costs are not, in, not insignificant. And, uh, you know, this is a, a big thing for us. You know, we need to really get on top of this. Yeah, thank you, Nice. Uh, I just want to thank all the speakers again. We've done a wonderful um, job of giving us the great information in a very concise way. The other thing about our speakers is we all had a very strong Indian connection, some by relationship and some by the sheer number of curries they've had in their lifetime. And I thank you all again for joining us. This quick <laughs> word from uh, Manish Bhatia, who would like to talk about our next uh, webinar in a few weeks' time. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Shah. Um, uh, so speakers, the, the session has been excellent. Shah, you've done a wonderful job. Uh, thank you all of you for attending uh, 60 or 60 plus people have attended our webinars consistently, which shows that they are really, really solid and really good for people who are taking the exam, as well as for general orthopedic surgeons for their day to day practice. Uh, so our last webinar for this year is uh, our next Sunday, 11 a.m. It's on pediatric orthopedics. And it will cover all important topics which we want to be covered for exam, especially DDH. Sufi, Perthes disease, and pediatric trauma. Uh, so do, do not forget to attend that. Also a reminder about uh, the feedback um, form, please. It's a very short feedback form. It will help to improve our webinars for future. Uh, and, and it will automatically generate a certificate once you have uh, filled the feedback form. Um, I would like to thank um, everybody in BO, especially Sunil Garg and BJ for their amazing support. We'll be carrying on with core topics of trainees uh, series webinars, and we'll cover all the core topics. Uh, we'll be starting our webinars next year in March. Um, and that's why the feedback is very important. Um, so look forward to all of you to join us next Sunday. And bye-bye. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well done, Shah. Very good session. No, thank you to all amazing. the speakers. They were the stars. Very, very Excellent good session, Shah, and all the speakers. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah.